Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we are discussing, we are discussing about the different properties of the enzyme. And in this context, uh, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the development of the field of enzymology. And subsequent to that, we have also discussed about the nomenclature and as well as the classification of the enzymes. And uh, we have also discussed about the structural studies of the prop, uh, of the enzyme. So, we have discussed about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structure of the enzyme. And the previous two modules, we were discussing about how you can be able to uh, produce the enzyme in the bulk quantities so that you can be able to use them for various type of applications such as you can use them for, uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, you know for understanding the properties of that enzyme or you can actually be able to use them for industrial applications. So, in this context we have discussed about the uh, isolation of the gene, we have discussed about the, uh, uh, we have discussed about how you can be able to clone that gene into the vector of your interest and so on. And uh, once you got the clone and then you are actually going to transform or you are going to deliver the DNA into the host of your choice, then subsequent to that you are actually going to have a screening assays. You have to perform the screening assays so that you can be able to uh, differentiate between the host which got the DNA and which does not get the host DNA. Okay. So, that we are going to discuss in today's lecture. So, in the today's lecture, we are going to discuss about how you can be able to screen the recombinant clone. So, now let us to talk about the screening. Uh, the screening is a very important aspect and when you want to screen anything, right, when you want to screen, you should actually going to screen a population based on the exclusive properties uh, of and uh, when we talk about the vector, the vectors are also or the clone is actually going to give you the exclusive properties and these exclusive properties can be exploited for screening the recombinant clone. So, let us discuss about this in our subsequent slide. So, uh, screening of the recombinant clone. So, you can imagine that this is a, a vector right and where you might have cloned now, this vector is actually going to provide you the various exclusive properties so that it can be prop, it cannot be exhibited by the uh, by the plain vector, but it can be exhibited by the recombinant DNA. So, one of the uh, screening criteria is that this particular recombinant clone probably could express some enzyme and this enzyme is going to catalyze a reaction where it is actually going to convert the substrate into the product and this product probably could be colored or it could actually be able to give you some green or red or blue some color and it this product is actually going to give the color to the cell and that's how you can say okay blue colored cells are transformed or blue colored cells are actually taken up the dna of whatever you exogenously added the second uh, and the most uh, popular method is that you can actually be work with the antibiotic resistance genes and this antibiotic resistance gene is actually going to provide the survival of, of the host cell which actually got the DNA. For example, in this particular vector what you see is it has the ampicillin gene. So, this ampicillin resistance gene is actually going to provide the resistance against the ampicillin. And uh, because the uh, plane vector or the plane host will not actually going to survive because it would not actually going to have the ampicillin resistance and uh, that is going to be the criteria what how you can actually be able to use the antibiotic resistance genes. The third is the phenotype. Okay, So, phenotype is where you can actually be able to use that for that when you are when the cells are going to ex, you know take the DNA they are actually going to show you some phenotypic changes. So, either of these three broader criteria can be used in different uh, different screening methods. So, the first method what we are going to discuss is the blue white screening and blue white screening is uh, where you are actually going to use a enzyme to 
convert the substrate into the product and that's how this product is actually going to give the blue color to the cell okay so it's going to give the blue color to the cell so uh, it is actually going to use a chromogenic substrate the use of the chromogenic substrate to detect a particular enzymic activity is the basis to screen the desired clone the most popular system to exploit this feature is called as blue white screening where a colorless substrate is processed to a colored compound right the colored colorless compound xgal or it's also called as 5 bromo 4 chloro 3 endolyl beta d galactosidase is used in this screening method is a substrate for the beta galactosidase the enzyme beta galactosidase is the product of the laxi gene of the lag operon it is a tetrameric protein and it is an in initial n terminal region like the 11241 of the protein is important for the activity of the protein in this system the host containing lag g lag gene without the initial reagent whereas the vector contain the alpha peptide to complement the defect to form the active enzyme as a result if a vector containing alpha peptide will be transformed into the host containing the remaining lag z the two fragment will constitute to form the active enzyme in addition the alpha peptide region in the vector contains mcs and as a result of insertion of the gene fragment consequently alpha peptide will not be synthesized to give the fully active beta synthase the enzyme beta galactosidase oxidizes the x gal to form the 5 bromo 4 chloryl endoxyl and galactose the endoxyl derivative is oxidized in air to give a blue colored dibromo dichloro derivative hence the blue colored colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme and the absence of insert whereas the colorless colonies indicate presence of an insert so this is actually going to be reversal of what we have discussed right so if the enzyme is active it is going to convert the exgal into the blue colored compound but since we are going to clone the gene of our interest into the alpha region of the protein uh, and once the clone is going once the gene you are going to insert that it will not going to complement the uh, remaining portion which is present in the host and that as a result the it will not going to show you the activity so the cells which will not show you the activity and remain colorless are actually going to be the transformed cells so this is what we have explained here right so the beta galactosidase is a is a protein which is actually going to be expressed for lac operons so what you have is you have a lac g zine which has a missing 11 to 41 uh, region okay so if you express that it is actually going to give you a inactive beta galactosidase whereas this re missing region is actually going to be present onto the vector which actually has called as lag z uh, prime so this lag z fragment when it combines with this inactive beta galactosidase it is actually going to give you the active beta galactosidase and this active beta galactosidase is going to convert the x gal which is a colorless product into a blue colored product and what reaction it is catalyzing it is actually converting this colorless compound into a blue colored 5 5 dibromo 4 4 dichloro indolyl okay so this is a colored compound blue colored compound so since you are cloning the gene into this particular lag z area right you are even if the fragment is being, being produced it is also not going to complement the beta galactosidase and that's why you are going to have the two uh, 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 scenarios in one scenario one when the only the vector is present it is actually going to give you the active beta galactosidase and that's how it is actually going to be uh, be able to convert the colorless x gal into the blue colored product but if the insert is present it is actually going to give you the inactive beta galactosidase and inactive beta galactosidase will not be able to convert the x gal into the blue colored compound okay and that's why if you see the reaction or if you see the colonies what will happen is that you're going to get the blue colored colonies 
and you are going to get the colorless colonies okay so these colorless colonies are the colonies where you are going to have your recombinant dna okay because of the simple reason that the it is actually going to have the inactivation of lac c then the second criteria is the antibiotic sensitivity okay so antibiotics are the uh, are the drugs which are actually being responsible for inactivation or the killing of the bacteria and it happens because the antibiotics disrupt the some of the uh, you know functioning of the cellular properties okay so for example there are antibiotics which are disrupting the translation steps there are antibiotics which are disrupting the transcriptions and there are other antibiotics which are disrupting the protein synthesis so if you add the antibiotic into the media it will not allow the propagation of the normal bacterial cells right because it is going to disrupt the some of these crucial metabolic pathways but if you have the antibiotic resistance genes so most of these antibiotic resistance genes are actually going to inactivate the exogenously added antibiotics and that's how it is actually going to allow the proliferation of the bacterial cell if they will actually going to have the transform bacteria so in this case uh, vector vector carries a functional selection marker such as the antibiotic resistance genes and to be used to select the clones the antibiotic resistance gene product has a multiple mechanism to provide the resistance in the host cell in this approach a circular plasmid containing antibiotic resistance can be able to replicate into the host cell plated onto a antibiotic containing media in the cloning of a fragment into the plasmid the plasmid is cut with a restriction enzyme and a fragment in a, is ligated to give circular plasmid with insert the transformation of the both dna species cut plasmid and the circularized clone into the host and plated onto the antibiotic containing solid media only circularized clone will give colonies whereas cut plasmid will not grow as it has lost antibiotic resistance genes so this is the table what i have given and you will see that these are the antibiotics like the ampicillin kanamycin tetracycline chloramphenicol and these are the gene product from the antibiotic resistance genes so it will actually going to be beta lactamase neomycin phosphotransferase ribosomal protection proteins and the chloramphenicol acetyl transferase so these are the gene product which are going to be responsible for the inactivation of these antibiotics and what what is the mechanism for example in the case of beta lactamase it is actually going to degrade the ampicillin similarly in the neomycin phosphatidyl transferase it is actually going to make the covalent modification of the kanamycin and as a result the kanamycin will not be able to uh, uh, you know do its action similarly we can have the ribosomal protection protein which is actually going to have the efflux of the tetracycline outside the bacteria so that's how since the bacteria tetracycline will not be able to enter into the bacteria it will not be able to uh, interfere with the protein synthesis similarly we can have the cat genes and the cat gene is going to acetylate the chloramphenicol to acetyl chloramphenicol and that also is going to interfere with the action of the chloramphenicol so what we are going to do in this is we are going to have the two uh, dna species one is this is the recombinant clone where you have cloned the dna into the mcs and it is going to be circularized whereas once you have the cut vector it this does not have the you know uh, it's circular dna okay so once you transform and if you put it onto the ampicillin containing plate this bacteria is actually going to grow because it has the ampicillin resistance gene and that will actually going to degrade the ampicillin so it will actually allow the bacteria to grow whereas when you do the transformation of this cut vector since the cut vector it will not be able to replicate it will actually going to will not be able to express the ampicillin resistance gene and as a result it will not be able to go and form the colonies then the third approach is the insertional inactivations okay so insertional inactivation in this approach a foreign dna is cloned within the coding gene responsible for a phenotype as a result of insertion the gene product is not available to modulate the phenotype of the host this approach is known as insertional inactivation and it can be used for a suitable gene generic genetic system for example in an insertional inactivation of the lac g right 
So lac C is a part of the lac operon and it is responsible for the synthesis of beta galactosidase. And you know that the XGAL system can be used to detect the insertional inactivation of the lac Z gene to screen the cloned fragment. If the gene is inserted into the lac Z, the clone will not be able to produce a functional beta galactosidase. Hence, blue colored colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme or the absence of insert, whereas the colorless colonies indicate the presence of an insert. So, this is what uh, you have a lac Z, which is actually going to produce the functional beta galactosidase, and that is actually going to convert the XGAL into a blue colored compound. And as a result, what you're going to see is you're going to see a blue colored colonies. But if you have the BAMH1 site and if you use this BAMH1 site, which is there in the lag Z, and if you use that and you will insert, then you are actually going to put your insert within the coding sequence of the lag Z. And as a result, what will happen is that it is actually going to give you the non-functional beta galactosidase and if you have the non-functional beta galactosidase it will not be able to catalyze this particular reaction and as a result it is actually going to give you the colorless colonies so these colorless colonies are the colonies which are actually going to have the recombinant dna so it is actually going to say that okay recombinant dna is present so if you are transforming the vector and if you are transforming the vector which contains the recombinant dna uh, the colorless colonies are going to say that it is a vector which contains the recombinant DNA. Then we have the insertional inactivation of the antibiotic resistance genes and that we this example I have taken from the vector which is called as PBR322. So in the PBR322 it has the two antibiotic resistance genes. It has the ampicillin resistance genes and it has the tetracycline resistance genes. Okay. So, if a gene fragment will be cloned in SCA1, which is a uh, restriction enzyme, it will disrupt the ampicillin resistance gene. And as a result, the clone will be ampicillin sensitive and tetracycline resistance. Okay? So, whereas the original plasmid will be ampicillin and tetracycline resistance. To select the clone, first the transformed E. coli is plated onto a tetracycline containing media. Subsequently, a replica plate will be made on the ampicillin containing medium to identify the clone growing on the tetracycline media but not on the ampicillin media. Which means if you have cloned a fragment into a SCA utilizing the SCA as a decision site, what will happen is that it is actually going to disrupt the ampicillin resistance. Okay? So, it is going to disrupt the beta lactamase gene. So, as a result, this particular clone is going to be sensitive for the ampicillin action. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to transform this onto the, into the bacteria and we are going to get the colonies. Now, this transform bacteria, what you can do is just make a replica plate of this plate and then you grow this first with the tetracycline. Okay? So, when you grow them with the tetracycline, both of these clones are actually going to grow. Okay? And then if you put them onto the ampicillin, what will happen is that it is this ampicillin resistance is actually going to kill some of the bacteria. For example, in this case, if you compare this and that, what you see is this, this particular bacteria is being not present here. So, and similarly, you can have some more bacterial colonies which are going to be present in the presence of tetracycline, but they will not be present in presence of ampicillin. So, these are the clone which are actually containing the recombinant DNA. Okay? So, what you are going to do is you can just go back and take out these clones from the master plate and that is how you are going to be able to select the transform plates or you are going to be select the colonies which contains the recombinant DNA. Then we have the third example of insertional inactivation of the CI repressor. So, CI repressor is a uh, is a, is a protein which is responsible for the uh, shuttling of the virus between the lytic phase and the lysogenic phase. So, during an infection cycle, the virus undergoes a lytic and the lysogenic stages and the CI repressor is a, is a protein uh, which is going to you know function as the shuttling uh, protein. So, 
the lytic cycle phase is responsible for the lysis of the host to release the virus particle whereas the lysogenic phase allow the replication of the virus without of lysis of the CI gene encodes for a CI repressor and which is responsible for the formation of the lysogens. Okay? In the presence of the functional CI, the plaque containing unlysed host cells and has a turbid appearance, whereas in the absence of it, it will be clear. This feature can be used to screen the clone to detect the functional CI or the absence of CI. Okay? So, if we have a functional CI, it will say that you do not have the recombinant DNA. If you have the non-functional CI, then it will say, okay, recombinant DNA, okay. So, this is what it is shown here, right. So, CI is a temperature sensitive uh, suppressor, repressor. So, if you change the temperature, the CI repressor is going to be expressed and it is actually going to shuttle the virus from the lytic to the lysogenic phase, okay. And if it is in the lysogenic phase, it will not going to allow the formation of the plaques. But when you clone the protein and you clone it into the CI repressor gene, it is actually going to produce a non-functional CI repressor. Okay? And when you present the non-functional CI repressor, repressor uh, it will actually going to shift the protein, uh, shift the uh, cycle towards the lytic phase. Okay? And as a result, it is actually going to form the plaque which are going to be, uh, you know, which will say that it is actually going to be the presence of recombinant DNA. Then the third approach is the complementation of the mutations. So, complementation of the mutation in this approach, a mutant gene can be used to screen the plasmid containing the missing gene and the transformant will grow only if the gene product from the clone will complement the function. In general, the gene taking part in the metabolic pathway or biosynthetic pathway are routinely used for this purpose. There are three important requirements in this approach. Okay? So, what is the complementation of the mutation is that the host is mutated for a crucial gene. Okay? So, this host will not grow until this particular gene product. So, this it is actually missing with this particular gene. So, if you supply the gene product, right? if you supply the gene product which is present on the vector, uh, then this is actually going to grow. Okay? So, this is called as complementation that the host is mutated in such a way that it will not grow until you provide the gene product and that gene product you are actually going to provide by the recombinant DNA. So, in this there are three requirements of this approach. The host strain deficient in a particular gene, if the gene belongs to the biosynthetic pathway, the mutant host in the case are called oxotroph as host depends on the gene product or the final product of the biosynthetic pathway as a supplement in the media for the growth. So, uh, in some cases, uh, this particular gene could be a part of the metabolic pathway and gene could be actually be responsible for providing the some crucial biosynthetic molecule. So, either you provide the gene product or you can be able to product, you, uh, you can be able to provide that product into the media okay? and as a result it is actually going to give you the growth of this mutant or this mutated host in the presence of this particular product in media. For example, if this gene is responsible for the synthesis of uracil. Okay? So, if you do not have this gene, the uracil will not be able to synthesize and this particular host will not be able to grow. But if you provide the uracil into the media, then if you add the uracil into this media, then this media is actually going to supply the nutrient and that is how this host is actually going to grow. Then a defined media, so you should have a defined media with a missing nutrients, right? Because while you are doing uh, growing this particular host, you actually can use the media which actually contains the uracil. But you should also have a defined media where this particular nutrient is also missing. So, that when the nutrient is missing, the host is looking for that particular nutrient and that nutrient you will get if the vector is going to supply the gene. And then you also require a vector containing gene to supply the gene product to complement. Now, let us see how it works. 
So, you can actually be able to do the complementation to the mutation in a positive feed selection or you can actually be able to do the negative selection. In the positive selection, in the positive selection host strain does not grow on the media lacking a functional gene but the host transformed with a recombinant clone can be able to supply the gene product required to grow in the media. So that is called as a positive selection. Positive selection means you are supplying the gene product from the recombinant DNA and that's how the host is actually going to survive and it will actually grow and it will give you the colony. Negative selection, negative selection is that when you are actually going to you know restore the uh, activity of the gene, it will actually going to kill the uh, transform host. So, in the negative selection, a chemical compound is added to the media which will be converted into a cytotoxic agent in the presence of the gene product and as a result, it does not allow the growth of the wild type. But the host strain transformed with the recombinant clone has non-functional gene product and it grow in the presence of compound in the media. For example, in this particular case, we have taken an example where we have taken an example of URA3. So, URA3 is a gene which codes for the orotidine 5 prime monophosphate or OMP decarboxylase and an active enzyme process this particular compound which is called as 5 fluorouretic acid to a toxic compound which is called as fluorodeoxyuridine and generation of the this toxic compound kills the cells carrying the functional ura3 genes so what we have is we have the gene of ura3 which actually provides a pro enzyme which is called as omp decarboxylase and omp decarboxylase process this particular compound like 5 fluorouretic acid to the fluorodeoxyuridine which is a toxic compound and when the this toxic compound is being generated it will actually going to kill the cells this means if you have the functional OMP decarboxylase, it is actually going to indicate that there is no recombinant DNA. Similarly, if you have cloned the uh, fragment within this particular gene, then what you have done is you have done the insertional inactivation of this particular gene. Now, if you have done the insertional inactivation or you have produced the non-functional OMP decarboxylase, this non-functional OMP decarboxylase is not going to uh, you know convert the 5 fluorouretic acid to the fluorodeoxyuridine and as a result it will allow the growth of these cells and the ura 3 minus minus cells ok. So, this is actually going to give sell you that if you got the colonies this means the OMP decarboxylase is inactive. Then these are the these are the methods are more popular in the prokaryotic system. Let us talk about now how you can be able to screen the clones into the mammalian system. So, a screening of the transfected mammalian cells. First method is the reporter gene assay. Okay. So, in the reporter gene assay system, a chimeric construct is produced with the enzyme gene. With, the, with an enzyme gene which is cloned in front of the promoter of the gene of interest, the gene reporter gene, uh, the gene reporter gene construct contain a eukaryotic promoter and an enzyme for easy readout. The reporter gene construct is transfected into the mammalian cells with a suitable transfection agent, right? Afterwards, the cells are being stimulated with the agent to stimulate the production of transcription factor to bind the promoter and drive the expression of the reporter gene. A suitable uh, substrate is added to measure the activity of the reporter gene. So, this is what you have the promoter which and you also have a gene, a reporter gene which is going to express an enzyme and this enzyme is going to convert the substrate into the product. And this product readout you can be able to study with the help of the several methods like you can do the fluorescence, you can do the uh, uh, luminescence, you can also be able to do the UV visibles. Okay. So these are the reporter gene construct what you can use for screening the mammalian clones like the CAD gene, LAGZ, luciferase, 4A and the GFP. And the gene product are CAD G, chloramphenicol acyl transferase 
then uh, lac g beta galactosidase luce, luce is uh, for the luciferase and 4a is for alkaline phosphatase and gap is the green fluorescent protein and the reaction what you are going to see for catalyzing is that uh, when you have the chloramphenicol acyl transferase it is going to run like chloramphenicol to acetyl, uh, acetyl uh, chloramphenicol and so on so uh, in a, in a typical reaction, uh, you can actually be able to use like luciferase for example, reported gene system. So luciferase is an enzyme which is present in the abdomen of firefly photinus spiralis. The enzyme utilizes the deluciferin as a substrate to form the oxyluciferin. In the presence of ATP magnesium luciferin is getting converted into the luciferin adenylate involving pyrophosphate cleavage and the transfer of AMP into the luciferin and the luciferin adenylate undergoes oxidative decarboxylation to form the oxyluciferin and uh, simultaneously there will be uh, emission of light. The reported gene construct containing luciferase is transfected into mammalian cell. The cells are washed with PBS and lysed with the lysis buffer, take the lysate into the luminomotor cuvette and luciferin substrate is injected to start the reaction and measured immediately in a luminometer. So these are the reactions what your luciferase is going to catalyze and ultimately it is going to produce the light and this light can be measured with the help of the luminometer. So what you are going to do is you are going to first take the look expressing vector, you are going to clone your recombinant DNA into this right. And then you are going to do the transfection. So once you got the transfection, you are going to have the eukaryotic cell which has the uh, this recombinant DNA which contains the look uh, gene in, in front of the promoter. And then you what you are going to do is you are going to lyse the cells and that is how you are going to have the cell lysate. And this cell lysate you can put into the 96 cell plate. You can take the black plate right. And, uh, and you can take the negative controls, you can take the positive control and so on and uh, then you can just put it into the luminometer right and what luminometer is going to do is it is actually going to give you the signal for the luminescence and that signal is response is, is actually a light which is going to come from the activity of the luciferase. The reporter gene construct containing luciferase is transfected into the mammalian cells. The cells are washed with PBS and lysed with a lysis buffer. Take the lysate into the luminometer cubit or plate and uh, you add the luciferin substrate and it is injected to start the reaction and measured immediately in a luminometer. The second method is you can actually be able to use some fluorescent protein to look at the transfection of the uh, screening of the transfected mammalian cells. So you can take the chimeric construct with the GFP protein for example. So in the live cells the GFP protein is a good choice as the reporter gene to screen to cells containing recombinant protein closely tagged with the GFP at their C or the N terminus. The cells receiving recombinant DNA will give green fluorescence and it can be visualized with an inverted fluorescent microscope and it can be analyzed in a flow cytometer to separate the GFP containing cells from the untransfected cell. Flow cytometer analysis uh, the cell based on the shape, size and fluorescence. A non-fluorescent cell is giving separate peak as compared to the fluorescent label cell and with the help of the flow cytometer. Both of these peak can be collected in a separate tube. Besides GFP, the other protein what you can use is RFP and YFP and CFP. And so what you are going to do is you are going to transfect the cells and what you see in the under the inverted microscope that all the cells are showing a green color fluorescence. And if you want be interested to collect these cells, what you can do is you can just put into the flow cytometer and flow cytometer is actually going to separate the molecules based on the fluorescence. So these are the control untransfected cells, these are the GFP expressing uh, recombinant DNA containing cells and that is how you can actually be able to collect these cells in a separate tube and they will be the recombinant cells or uh, the cells with the recombinant DNA, cells with recombinant DNA and these cells you can separate out and that is how you can actually be able to use them for subsequent experiments. 
So this is what we have discussed so far, how you can be able to screen the compounds, you can get the suitable clones. Now the question is, if you have done the cloning and you got the suitable clone, how you can be able to verify the clone, okay. So you, because that is very important, right. So you can actually be able to verify the clone uh, by several methods, okay. So what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the screening of the clone and now what you got is you got the recombinant clone which are present in the uh, LB agar plate. Now the next question is how you can be able to verify the clone, okay. Because the verification of the clone is very important to that so that you should not misguide because you know and uh, verification of the clone can be done with the help of the DNA sequencing. You can actually be able to sequence the clone to know that whether the, your, uh, the gene of your interest is a uh, fragment is also present, okay. So the confirmation of the cloned DNA can be done by the DNA sequencing. Historically, there are two methods of DNA sequencing with a similar principle of breaking the DNA either the chemical method or the enzymatic method into the small fragment followed by the separation and analyze them on a high resolution electrophoresis gel. So in a typical DNA sequencing what you are doing is you are taking the DNA sequence okay, and then you are breaking that into the multiple fragments and all these fragments either you are using the uh, chemical method which is called as Maxim Gilbert method or you are using the enzymatic method which is called as Sanger's method. So either with the help of the chemicals or the enzyme you are you know breaking this uh, DNA sequence into the smaller fragment and all these fragments are then going to be separated in a high resolution um, uh, polyacrylamide gels and then the signal are going to be analyzed for interpreting the sequences. So let us just first talk about the enzymatic method or the Sanger method. So the first method what is being discovered is the dideoxy chain termination or the Sanger's method. This method is originally been developed by the Frederick Sanger's in the year of 1977 for which the Frederick uh, Sanger's got the Nobel Prize. In this method, a single stranded DNA is used as a template to synthesize the complementary copy with the help of a polymerase in the presence of nucleotide. The polymerization reaction contains a primer and a nucleotide. So you can have the three normal nucleotides and a 2 prime 3 prime dioxy nucleotide triphosphate. This means it is actually you are going to take the single standard DNA and you are going to perform the PCR with the help of the three nucleotides which are going to be normal plus one nucleotide which is 2 prime 3 prime DD NTPs. So what will happen is so you are going to run the multiple reactions of the same for the same DNA. So but you will actually going to change the DD NTPs. In some cases you are going to take the ATP, in some cases you will take the GTP, you, in some cases you will take the uh, CTP and in the other case you will take the uh, uh, TTP okay. So this means for every DNA sequence you are going to run the four reactions and in four reactions you will take either the DD, DD ATP plus you will take the all other remaining three uh, nucleotides okay. So that is how you are going to uh, you know make the four different types of reactions. When the DNA polymerase utilizes uh, dideoxy nucleotide uh, as a nucleotide it gets incorporated in the growing chain, but the chain elongation stops at the DDNPs due to the absence of the 3 prime hydroxyl group. In the typical sequencing reaction, you are going to run 4 different DDNPs are taken into the 4 separate reaction and analyzed onto a high resolution polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. The ratio of NTP and DATP is adjusted so the chain termination occur at the each position of the base in the template. Now this is what exactly you are going to do. In the Sanger's protocol, what you are going to do is you are going to first take the DNA sequence okay, and you are going to have the 
uh, terminal uh, sequence okay so then you add the primers okay and when you add the primer okay and you are going to have the two uh, options either you go with the sangers protocol or you go with the labeling as well as the termination protocol so in the sangers protocol what you are going to do is you are going to add the uh, DATPs and the clinome fragments and you are going to label the DNA and then you are going to divide this DNA into the four reactions. In the reaction A or that will be called as A reaction you are going to add the DDT ATP and the remaining three NTPs. In the second uh, reaction so this is the reaction number one in the second reaction you are going which is called as T reactions you are going to add the DD, TTP but and the rest three nucleotides which are normal nucleotides. Then in the reaction number three you are going to add the or which is called as G reaction which is called as DD, TTP and the three G DNTPs. And in the fourth reactions you are going to take the uh, C reaction which is called as DD, CTP plus the four uh, three remaining uh, NTPs. And of, after every reaction you add you are going to put them for chase which means you allow the DNA to be synthesized. So in the step 1 your a primer is added and annealed to the 3 prime of the DNA template. The radio labeled ATP is being added to label the primers. Then the step 3 the polymerase reaction is divided into the 4 reactions and in the step 4 DNA synthesis continue until terminated by the incorporation of the specific DDNTPs either the A, T, G or C and in the step 5 a chase of polymerization reaction is performed in the presence of high concentration of NTPs to extend all non-terminated sequences into the high molecular weight DNA. This high molecular weight DNA will not enter into the sequencing reaction. In the labeling or the chain termination protocol, this is the labeling and the chain termination protocol. In the step 1, a primer is added and aligned to the 3 prime of the DNA template. Then in the step 2, a limited amount of NTPs are added along with the one of the radio labeled nucleotide to label the DNA throughout the DNA, throughout the length. Then the step 3, the polymerase reaction is divided into the 4 reactions just like as we discussed here. Uh, and the polymerase reaction continues with the 4 nucleotide and out of 4 one of them would be the dideoxy NTPs. Synthesis is terminated at the specific DNA NTPs either A, G, C or T to give the DNA fragments of the different length. Now when you got the DNA fragments of the different length right from C for example from the same DNA you are going to get first big strand then you are going to get this then you are going to get this like this right and so all these fragment has to be analyzed onto a high resolution SDS page and when you analyze them you are going to get this kind of fragments okay. So you are going to divide that into four reactions A reactions, T reaction, G reaction and C reaction. Now so imagine that we have started with this particular DNA sequence. So A reaction you are going to get a fragment here right. For T reaction you got the fragment here okay and uh, for G reaction you got the spot here and for the T, uh, C reaction you got the fragment here okay. Now what you have to do is you have to run in a reverse orientation like this. You have to walk when you interpret this you are going to walk like this okay and that is how you are going to get first sub A then AT then ATT then ATTA so that is what you are going to do and uh, and that is how you are going to get the complete fragment DNA or the sequence of the DNA what you have uh, started with okay. So in a Sanger sequencing method what you have is you have a uh, you know DNA what you have a target DNA and that you have to sequence. So what we have in a, you know if you want to do a DNA sequencing using the Sanger sequencing method you have the two way either you can go with the gel filtration chromatography, gel electrophoresis or you can do the capillary electrophoresis. So the first step is that where you have to take the your DNA into the append off and then you have to add the primers. These uh, primers uh, you have to add into the four reactions. If you remember, we have said that you have to divide the reactions into the four reactions. 
and then you have to add the DNA polymerase into the each reactions. So you have to add the reaction number one, one, two, three, and four. And uh, once you added the DNA polymerase into the four reactions, then you are going to add the nucleotides. You have to add the all the four nucleotides like C, T, A, and G in all the four reactions. And in the subsequent step, uh, you are going to add the, the dideoxynucleotides. So, as if you recall, you can have the four different reactions, A reactions, T reactions, C reaction, and the G reaction. And in all of these, you have added the dideoxynucleotide. And what is the difference between a normal versus uh, dideoxynucleotides? The difference between a normal DNTP is that it has uh, the 5, uh, five prime uh, uh, phosphate and you have the hydroxyl group at the 3 prime whereas in the case of dideoxynucleotide you have the uh, in this OH is missing and because of this OH is missing it is actually going to do the it will going to stop the synthesis let's see how it is actually going to stop the synthesis so you can imagine that if there is a uh, by the DNTPs, it actually will going to form a bond by the uh, by the phosphodiester linkage, and the OH is still there, so that will continue the synthesis. Whereas in the case of the dideoxynucleotides, once the dideoxynucleotide is going to use its uh, phosphate and going to form the phosphodiester linkage, since the OH is missing on this side, it will not going to allow the incoming nucleotide to bind. So that's how it is actually going to stop the synthesis of the, uh, uh, the DNA synthesis by the uh, DNA polymerase. Now what you have to do is you have to take the four reactions and put it into the thermal cyclers where you have the all the reagents. In the thermal cycler you have the different steps like in the first step you are going to do the denaturations. So in the denaturation step you are going to increase the temperature of the thermal cycler and once you increase the temperature of the reactions the two strands of the DNA are going to remove uh, uh, going to be uh, detached and then you are going to add the primers and the primer will anneal and then there will be an extension but what will happen is if there will be a diety of the NTPs then it is actually going to terminate the reactions wherever the, the, the dideoxy will find the enzyme will find the dideoxy. So what you see here is that the termination is happening at every A. Uh, so if it is going to find the A, you it will going so it will going to give you the DNA of different reactions. Same is going to happen for the dideoxy uh, T reactions. So all the T wherever you have the T it is actually going to terminate the reactions. Uh, same is true for the C reactions. So wherever you could find the C, it is actually going to terminate. Like uh, here it is going to terminate and so on. So uh, same is uh, going to happen even for the G reactions that the, uh, wherever it is find the G, it is actually going to terminate. So for example, in this case, it has find the G at the end. So it is going to terminate at this point, then it is going to terminate at this point and that's how you see they are actually going to give you the different reactions. Now what you have to do is you have to take out these reactions from the thermal cyclers and then uh, you have to resolve these samples onto the gel electrophoresis. So you have to take the all the four reactions and load it into the four different wells and you know that the DNA is negatively charged. So it is actually going to uh, resolve onto the gel electrophoresis. So you load the fourth reactions and then you connect it to the power pack and you turn on. So when you turn on the DNA is going to run from the negative to positive because the DNA is negatively charged because the DNA is having a uh, phosphate, as phosphate backbone and that actually gives the negative charge to the DNA. So because of the negative charge it goes towards the positive electrodes uh, in the gel electrophoresis and you know that the uh, this migration is in 
inversely proportional to the size of the DNA. So the larger, smaller DNA will run faster and the larger DNA will run slower. Now what you have to do is, you, once you have resolved the, um, the DNA, you have the two ways in which you can be able to visualize this DNA. Uh, you have the either utilization of the radio labeled primers or you can use the labeled uh, DNTPs. Uh, uh, that, that labeling you can do with the radioactivity. So what you can do is you can use the P32 labeled DNA, a labeled basis, and that is actually going to label the DNA when the, it is actually going through with the uh, synthesis. So irrespective of whether you use the labeled primer or the labeled ATPs, once you got the DNA being resolved onto the agarose, then you have to do is you have to visualize the DNA band with the help of the autoradiography. So what you have to do is you have to take this gel, you have to take the agarose gel and put it into the gel cassette, put the X-ray films and then you close it and let it be exposed for overnight or 72 hours. During that period, the, the, the radioactivity what is present on the uh, gel is going to expose the X-ray film and that's how you are going to get the bands of the DNA. Now what as we discussed before, you have to read it in the reverse orientation which means you have to read it first this sequence, then 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 this sequence and that's how you are going to get the sequences from each band and what you have is this is your uh, DNA sequence. So what you have to do is you have to take this sequence and then these sequences and that is actually is going to be the DNA sequence what you are going to get. From the Sanger sphere. So this is all about the Sanger sequencing method what we have discussed. Now the second method is the Maxim Gilbert method. So this method was discovered by the Maxim and uh, Gilbert in 1977 which is based on the chemical modification and the subsequent cleavage. In this method a 3 prime or 5 prime radio labeled DNA is treated with a base specific chemical which randomly cleaves the DNA at their specific target nucleotide. These fragments are analyzed on a high resolution polyacrylamide gel and autoradiogram is developed. The fragment with the terminal radio labeled appear as a band in the gel which means what it is going to do is it is going to take a DNA fragment, it is going to label on one side with the radioactivity and then it is actually going to treat with the chemicals. Uh, these chemicals are specific. So they will either going to target the A nucleotide, they are either going to target T nucleotide, the G nucleotide or the C nucleotide. And as a result what you are going to get is you are going to get the small fragments of this DNA where the terminal DNA, uh, nucleotide you know that so on this side you already have a radioactivity right. But the, the place where it is actually going to be uh, cleaved is either A or T or G or C. This means here also you are going to run the four reactions, the A reactions, T reaction, G reaction and C reaction and that is how you are going to analyze these reactions and that is how they will going to give you the um, pat pattern of the DNA sequence. So the chemical reactions are performed in two steps, the base specific reaction and the cleavage reactions. Okay? So in the base specific reaction, different base specific reagents are used to modify the target nucleotide. Reaction 1 where you are going to use the dimethyl sulfate DMS and that is going to modify the N7 of the guanine and then open the ring between C8 and C9. So that is called as G reaction. Then you have a reaction 2 which is you are going to add the formic acid act as a purine nucleotide. So it is actually act on purine nucleotide. So it is actually going to be called as G plus A reaction by attacking on the glycosidic bond. Then reaction 3 it is going you are going to use the hydrazine and that is going to break the ring of the pyrimidine. So it is going to be called as T plus C reaction because it is not specific for the only C or T. It is actually going to attack on the pyrimidine basis. Then in the reaction 4 wherein in the presence of salt it breaks the ring of the cytosine and that is called as C reactions. Once you are done with this uh, base specific reactions then you are going to have the cleavage reaction. So after the base specific reaction the piperidine is added which will replace the modified bases and catalyze the cleavage of the phosphodiester bond next to the modified nucleotide. This means at the end what you are going to get, you are going to get a, a pattern like this okay? because here also you have added a radioactivity onto the 5 prime end. 
So, you are going to have the G reaction, G plus A reaction, T plus C reaction and the C reactions. The fragment in the G lane is read as G whereas the fragment present in G plus A but absent in G is read as A. Similarly, the fragment in C is read as C whereas the fragment present in T plus C but absent in C is read as T. To get the DNA sequence, the band with the lowest molecular weight is read followed by the next band in the 4 lane. For example, this means you are going to start from here and you are going to read like this, okay. But there is a, there is a uh, issue. G lane, the band is of lowest molecular weight followed by the band in the A lane, which means if you have the G, okay, and if you ha also have the same band in the G plus A reaction, this means you are not going to read this, okay. It means this is also going to be considered as G reaction. This means from here you are going to read this and then from here you are going to read this. From here you are going to see all these, these two bands are of the same level. This means it is going to be read as C. Then from here you are going to read this as G and so on. So, do you will actually go with the uh, you are going to go with the from the lower band to higher band. Okay, So, for the G between the G and G plus A you are going to if, if, you, if you have the bond in the same line you are going to read them as G. Similarly, if you have the T plus C band and C band you are going to read them as C. Okay, So, if you have got the two bands which are, which are present both in the T plus C and C then you are going to read that as C other than T. Okay, so same is true for the uh, A plus G and G plus uh, G reactions. So this is the way you can actually be able to sequence the cloned DNA, and that's how you can be able to verify the DNA. So uh, so far, what we have discussed, we have discussed about how you can be able to utilize the different types of tools, or as well as the features what are present into the vector and recombinant DNA and those are the which you can use for the screening of the recombinant DNA. And at the end we have also discussed about the DNA sequencing reactions so that you can be able to sequence the cloned DNA and that is how you can be able to verify the clone. So with this I would like to, uh, I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you. Mm -hmm.